Hello and welcome once again to a triumvirate build guide, this time for the druid archetype. Now, I'm no D&D expert, but I think it's clear that this archetype was heavily inspired by the druid from that universe. And the D&D gurus on YouTube all seem to agree that this class is all about versatility through its shape-shifting abilities. And the triumvirate incarnation is very similar. We'll have access to alteration, conjuration, and restoration spells, as well as powerful alchemical potions in human form a swift and deadly melee nightmare with howl abilities in the werewolf form, a tanky tree form powerhouse with the horned lord transformation, and an inconspicuous swift cross-country runner with the stag form. While there is some overlap, each form has pros and cons and specific scenarios that they are ideal for, both in terms of gameplay and roleplay considerations. If you want a nature-themed spellcaster with capacity for diverse gameplay styles and multiple transformations, then this is your build. First up, let's quickly go over the key mods you'll need to install before starting your playthrough. Triumvirate, Mage Archetypes. Ordinator, Perks of Skyrim. Imperius, Races of Skyrim. Odin, Skyrim Magic Overhaul. Hunterborn SE. Disable, Follower, Collision. Since this build will make use of a small army of nature, this is almost a necessity, as it allows you to pass through your friendly followers and minions without colliding with them. And finally, Growl, Where Beasts of Skyrim. For race, I went with Bosmer, as with Imperius, we get access to a permanent animal companion. The speed boost in werewolf form also translates to a large damage boost with the right perks. The Wood Elves also seem to have a stronger connection to nature and the forest than the other races, so it makes sense for roleplaying as well. The skills I used for this class were chosen to support the Triumvirate spells as much as possible. I went with Alchemy, Alteration, Conjuration, Enchanting, Light Armor, and Restoration. I also used Classic Classes and Birth Signs Reimagined. With that mod, I chose the Mage Birth Sign, which increases Magicka by 30 points, very useful in the early game. For standing stones, I started out with the mage stone to make spells more powerful, but also mainly for the faster progression and magic skills. Once the March of Oblivion perk from the Conjuration skill tree was obtained, I switched to the Lady Stone for the powerful Lunar Familiar Summon that is cast automatically upon entering battle. It's strong, useful, and it fits the theme really well. For religion, I started with Kinnereth, which is a great fit for the theme and playstyle of the Druid. You earn favor partly by discovering new locations and praying outside, which encourages wandering about the wilderness. As a follower, you get a movement speed buff in combat, which when perked properly, leads to increased damage output in both werewolf and horned lord forms. However, the devotee gift is a summonable sabercat mount, which, while awesome, becomes useless once the wild shaped druid spell is obtained. In the end, I landed on her scene. You earn favor simply by being a werewolf and defeating strong enemies. As a follower, you get a strong damage boost to damaged enemies, and as a devotee, you get to invoke a special hunt against an enemy within a 500 foot radius, which stays fun for the whole playthrough and works in all forms with all spells. I kept a generally even attribute spread throughout my playthrough, which enabled the gameplay diverse archetype of the druid. The druid can take many forms, which play in many different ways, so having a good amount of every attribute is important. That said, you'll probably want to start focusing a bit more on magicka once your health and armor get to a spot where survivability is a little bit more comfortable. This will enable you to benefit from the March of Oblivion perk in the Conjuration Tree as soon as possible, which has some very powerful effects with the Triumvirate Druid spells. For alchemy, it might be tempting to take many of these perks. However, there are only a few really key perks that are needed to enable this playstyle. 
Once other key perks are taken, feel free to come back here for more stretch goal perks. Obviously, you'll want both ranks of Alchemy Mastery for stronger potions overall. You'll also want to take Physician, though you may want to wait a bit until you decide what gameplay type you favor or what you need most help with. Choose Health if you feel like you need more help simply surviving combat. Choose Magicka if you want to spend most of your time in human form channeling summons and casting spells. You'll also want to choose Magicka if you want to spend most of your time in Horned Lord form where Magicka acts as a timer. Stamina is most helpful for Werewolf form where stamina pools can translate into damage output. This also applies to Horned Lord form at the expense of a reduced Magicka timer. I chose the Magicka potions as it seemed more versatile and I felt like I needed most help keeping my druid summons out longer. Stimulants recharge Magicka and Stamina when you enter combat, which is very useful for both Magic Slangin' and melee combat. It also regenerates at a rate that scales with your current attribute levels, so the higher they get, the faster it gets recharged. Lab Skeever is another essential perk. With the Hunterborn mod, you can craft a Mortar and Pestle, which Ordinator counts as an alchemy station. After activating the mobile lab, any potions taken in the next 20 seconds will be 25% stronger and last 15 times longer. This may be the strongest perk in this whole build. Lab Skeever does require the Advanced Lab perk, which does not apply to the Mortar and Pestle. And as you may be roleplaying your Druid as a Wandering Naturalist as I did, you may not get as much use out of this. However, Lab Skeever itself is well worth two perks on its own in my opinion. Crimson Haze increases movement speed for the duration of the potion you've taken. This translates to boosted unarmed damage output in both Beast form and Horned Lord form. A couple of notables here include Green Thumb and Double Toil and Trouble, which yields more ingredients and more potions respectively. This will help you get more out of the ingredients you grow with the Druidcraft spell, and this is nice to have if you have the perks to burn, but not necessary. For Alteration, you'll want to start with both ranks in Alteration Mastery for cheaper Alteration spells that last longer. You'll also want to take Alter Self Resistances for the Elemental Resistance. I took Fire and Frost Resistance to help with Dragon Fights. I also took Wild Shrines which gives a great incentive to explore the wilderness in search of stronger spells from all schools. Now you have some decisions to make with this tree. There is a very strong argument to make for Vancian Magic. It'll strengthen all spells and allow you to cast the expensive channeled summoning spells for free. However, once you run out of spells, you can't cast any more until you rest at an inn or a home. I decided against this for a few reasons. First, running out of spells basically forces you into beast form, which is a strong option, but decidedly against the theme of flexibility for this build, in my opinion. Second, in order to recharge your spells, you have to sleep either at an inn or an owned home. I roleplayed my druid as a wanderer who preferred to sleep at an outdoor camp, which doesn't count as a home or inn. You could set up a home mythal point and pitch camp close to that, but now we're talking more restrictions and more perk investment. So if you choose not to take Vancey and Magic, you'll want to get both ranks of the Intuitive Magic perk to get free casting of both the Raven and the Rattlesnakes from the Triumvirate Conjuration spells. Another perk to consider is Alter Self Attributes. You can pick one attribute to buff by 50 points, which is a large boost. Choose Magicka if you want to be able to cast more spells and stay in Horned Lord form longer. Choose Health if you're struggling to stay alive and choose Stamina if you want to do more damage in melee combat, in either Beast form or Horned Lord form. I went with Magicka in the name of versatility. One more perk you might want to consider is Throne of Nern. This hoists you up on an Earthen Spire, out of melee range, and boosts spell magnitude. However, some players find this effect annoying, and it does require the Geomancer perk to unlock, which requires an unarmored loadout for it to work. So this perk basically costs 2 points, and you may not like it. I, for one, did take this perk. The automatic trigger of the effect does take some getting used to, but it does help, and it does fit the theme of the build really well. Things start to get interesting with the Conjuration Tree, where the Triumvirate Channel Summons have some unique interactions with the Ordinator perks. You'll want to start with both ranks of Conjuration Mastery for the cheaper spell costs. The way the Triumvirate Druid channels his summons means that the increased effect time is useless to us, but that means that reduced spell cost is twice as important. The first really key perk in this tree is March of Oblivion, which gives you an extra minion per 250 points of base non-augmented magicka, making increased magicka investments around the mid-game very important. The goal here is only one extra minion, so 250 points of base magicka will do the trick for you, then you can invest in stamina to aid in melee damage. There are a few very interesting points to make about this perk. 
Firstly, it has a unique interaction with Triumvirate Druid summons in that it simply doubles the amount of minions called for during the duration of the spells. Better yet, this does not count toward your conjured minion total. So, you get these extra minions in addition to the expanded count of conventional minions. This is extremely powerful. Next, this one perk requires four additional non-key perks lower in the tree before it's available. However, it's strong enough to justify the five perk investment in my opinion, believe it or not. Also, I did end up using Atronox throughout the course of the game to give the druids some elemental flair since they do have access to elemental magic in other universes. These lower level perks do help to strengthen those summons. Finally, if you're using the Lady Standing Stone as suggested, the Lunar Familiar is counted toward your limit of conjured minions. The Lunar Familiar is a very powerful summon that is auto-triggered during combat and pretty much indispensable to this build as far as I'm concerned. March of Oblivion is therefore necessary if you want to cast Atronox alongside it. One other perk worth mentioning here is Edge of Oblivion, which allows one additional conventional minion. But when you have no minions active, you lose 250 points of armor and 50% magic resistance. With the Lady Stone and its Lunar Familiar, you'll likely not be spending much time without a minion, so this perk is a viable option. However, if you lose your Familiar and your Atronox and you run out of Magicka channeling your Druid summons, you'll be a sitting duck. This goes directly against the theme of adaptability for this build, therefore I chose not to take it. With conventional summons alongside the channel druid summons in addition to the Bosmer animal companion, I never felt lacking in the minion department, even early on in this playthrough. I originally added the enchanting skill to this build to take advantage of the spell scribe perk to launch spells from power attacks in both beast form and horned lord form. However, this didn't seem to work for me in horned lord form, and somehow that transformation also seemed to break the effect in beast form afterwards. So it wasn't worth it. It might just have glitched in my save, but it may not work for you either, so I can't recommend that perk. I did use enchanting in a more conventional way, however, starting with both ranks in the enchanting mastery perk. I also took gem dust to strengthen new enchantments, and regalia to add more power to enchanted jewelry. The attunement perk makes existing enchantments stronger. And finally, I took the twin enchantment perk to get an extra effect on each item. I'll talk more about which specific effects I took later on in the gear section. Much like alchemy, light armor is another skill that you may be tempted to take many perks in, and it's hard to go wrong with any of them, but I'll give the key minimal ones that are essential for this build and let you decide on how to spend any extras. You'll want to start with both ranks of the light armor mastery perk for simply better ratings on all the light armor you wear. Next you'll want to focus on the unarmed subtree on the left. All perks here are worth taking except for the hissing dragon perk. I was hoping that the magic wave effect would work in Horned Lord form as well as human and werewolf form, but it didn't for me. In fact, transforming to the Horned Lord form seemed to break this effect in human and werewolf form as well. This could just be a glitch on my end, but just make sure you have a save before you take this perk if you want to try it out for yourself. Lastly, you'll want to take the Light Armor Fit perk for even more armor rating, getting you ever closer to that coveted armor cap. And that's it for the key perks in this skill, but if you have extra points to spend, you'd be hard pressed finding a wasteful way to spend them here. Just make sure you've already taken the required perks in the other trees first. Most of the offensive spells in our arsenal are found in the Restoration School, so perks in this tree will be very important. While most of the perks in this skill would be useful, we'll try to focus on strengthening the spells themselves and perks that affect undead enemies. This will shore up our offensive capabilities that are resistant to our poison druid spells. Specifically, we'll want to take both ranks of the Restoration Mastery perk, which will make our offensive spells more powerful and cheaper to cast. We'll need to take Descending Light, which greatly boosts Magicka regen at the beginning of a fight. It's nice to have, but our powerful potions coupled with a good stock of good berries will keep our Magicka tanks full. But we will need that perk in order to take Hallowed Burial, which boosts Restoration spell effectiveness against Undead. We'll take both ranks of this perk. Exorcist is another perk that's nice to have, as it adds skill-based sunlight spells you can use against the undead. However, we really just want to get to the Crusader's Fire perk, which adds a damage over time effect to undead enemies under a turn effect, as well as makes them more vulnerable to physical attack. Coupled with Odin's improvements to the turn undead spells, this provides a fear effect along with damage over time and lowered defenses. A powerful combo indeed. As with alchemy and light armor, it's hard to waste perks in this tree, so you may want to come back here when you have extras to use. Just make sure you've taken the necessary perks in other skills first.
For gear, I went with the excellent Hedge Mage armor set with the male model patch. This set allows you to increase its armor rating through a series of magical rituals, which fits the theme really well. You can also temper the armor using the good ol' smithing skill, which I also did. I leveled my smithing to 100 using pelts obtained from wildlife, and used alchemy and enchanting to boost the skill. Having a separate set of crafting gear helped a ton. This all helped me to reach the armor cap at a fairly reasonable point in the playthrough. Once the armor cap was reached, I enchanted all the gear using powerful potions of fortify enchantment. On the hood, I used fortify magicka and the fortify potions effect from the summer mist mod, which causes potions to last longer. For the robes, I used fortify conjuration and fortify restoration effects, so spells from those skills cost less to cast. On the gloves, I used the fortify power attacks effect from summer mist and fortify unarmed, both of which do carry over to horned lord form. For the boots, I went with Fortify Stamina and the Reactive Barrier Summer Mist effect, which increases elemental resistance when struck by that element. On the ring, I used the Fortify Magicka and Fortify Unarmed effects. And for the necklace, I went with the Amplify Alteration and Amplify Restoration effects, which makes Alteration and Restoration spells stronger relatively. These effects are found in the Summer Mist mod as well. For the Horned Lord transformation, all equipped enchantments do carry over. This means that the Fortify Magicka effect is important to keep us in the form longer, Fortify Stamina is important for scaling unarmed damage through the unarmed perks, and Fortify Unarmed is important for obvious reasons. One last note on gear. With the Imperious mod Bosmer get a Harrier, or Hunting Bird, that periodically points out a nearby beast. Once you slay the beast, there will be some enhanced loot in its inventory, including spellbooks, alchemical ingredients, and even enchanted gear. It's a great way early and mid playthrough to flesh out your spell and enchantment catalog. For spells, we'll mainly be focused on the Triumvirate Druid spell pack, but there are a few we'll add to those. I'll go through all the key spells in each school now. Let's start off with Alteration. Druidcraft is the Triumvirate Druid's novice alteration spell which transforms a dead organic body into a harvestable plant. This can be a great source of alchemical ingredients early on before you have access to plantable pots to cultivate your most used ingredients. There's also a glitch or side effect when you use this spell after feeding on a corpse in beast form. If you transform back into human form and cast Druidcraft on the corpses you fed on, it'll count toward your werewolf perk progress a second time. Useful for if you're trying to level your beast form quickly, but make sure to avoid this scenario if you are averse to exploits. The Force of Nature spell provides perhaps the most powerful and nuanced form of this build. I could probably do an entire video on just this one spell, and I might still yet. But basically, this spell causes your character to transform into a gnarled wooden mass with boosted unarmed damage, which scales with your alteration skill, and also carries all unarmed perks from the light armor skill tree. You also get to carry the spell in your left hand through the transformation. What's more, you'll get to retain armor rating and enchantments from all of your equipped gear, except for weapons, and, of course, potion effects carry over as well. The Wild Shape spell transforms you into a swift deer when sprinting out of combat. Great for cross-country travel, it makes it so you never have to buy a horse. The Impenetrable Grove spell spawns a wall of trees wherever you're pointing. Despite its name, the wall is quite penetrable by arrows and bolts, at least in my experience. However, spells do seem to get caught in the branches quite frequently. This works best as an obstacle for melee enemies trying to get in on you. You can also use it for a boost to get up and over walls and obstacles. Chase the Horizon is a master level spell that teleports you and nearby followers up to 600 feet away. This is great for crossing large chasms and potentially skipping large chunks of some areas. Aside from the Triumvirate spells, I have found the Flesh spells useful at lower to mid levels before you've upgraded your gear enough to reach the armor cap. The Ash Rune spell is also great as it applies a theme appropriate paralysis effect. Purchase this spell from Talvis and Tel Mithrin in Soulslime. Tumble Magnet is a great spell from the Apocalypse spell pack that concentrates all enemies into an area. It's very useful in spell combos that I'll demonstrate later. There are many other nature-themed spells in the Apocalypse mod that fit this build really well, but they're not quite core to the build. However, I highly suggest experimenting with them and seeing which you'd like to add to your arsenal. And on to the Conjuration spells. The Triumvirate Druid summons are unique from other summons. You need to concentrate on the spell to channel the summon, draining magicka in the process. 
This might seem a bit weak since you'll spend Magicka quickly and can't use that hand to cast another spell. However, these summons do not count toward your summon total, so they are a great way to bolster your ranks. Dual casting, or taking March of Oblivion or Edge of Oblivion perks, will give you two summons instead of one. Each spell has a special effect when active. Call Raven will reduce enemy weapon skills by a scaling 40 points. Call Rattlesnakes will poison enemies for a scaling 2 health per second. Call Grey Wolf will cause living enemies below a scaling 20% health a large amount of bleed damage. Call Snow Leopard will drain a scaling 40 points of stamina. And Call Hound of Hercene will reduce enemies' armor by a scaling 250 points for a base duration of 10 seconds. In addition to the Triumvirate summons, I also made use of Storm Atronox and Storm Thralls for powerful traditional minions. This also brings a little storm magic into the druid's arsenal. Now let's move on to restoration spells. The druid restoration spells provide our main means of offense in human form, as well as some nice buffs for both the player and their followers. Spirit of the Oak is a nice novice level spell that provides a scaling 20 points of health fortification for a base duration of 60 seconds. This effect applies to living allies as well. This is a great Okado's recital candidate. Parasitic Growth is a fast-moving spell that does a scaling 1 bleed and poison damage for a base duration of 15 seconds on living enemies only. If the enemy dies while under the effect, a good berry will appear in its inventory. While a bit weak to start, this is your main means of offense until you gain access to the expert level Bramble Growth spell. So until you're able to scale this up, you need to rely on minions and unarmed attacks to supplement this one. This does also stay useful later in the playthrough for dragons and other unreachable or airborne enemies. Spirit of the Thornbriar applies a base 1 bleed and poison damage over a base duration of 8 seconds to any living enemy that lands a hit on the player or any ally. Another great candidate for Okado's recital. Bramble Growth becomes your main offensive spell against living enemies mid to late playthrough. It does much better damage with a scaling 10 bleed and poison damage over a base duration of 15 seconds, and it sprouts a good berry in the enemy's inventory on death. This translates to really decent damage when considering restoration skill scaling and potion and enchantment effects. The only real drawback is that it must be cast on the ground and the enemy must be on top of the affected area. Also, as an expert level spell, this eats Magicka fairly quickly. Strong crafted potions and hotkeyed good berries can help mitigate this though. Spirit of the Sun is a master level spell that applies a powerful healing over time effect to the player and all living allies. As this is a master spell, it takes both hands and can't be added to Okado's recital. So it's best to cast this before entering tough battles. Outside of the Triumvirate spells, I made heavy use of the Turn Undead and Turn Greater Undead spells. These spells are greatly improved by the Odin mod, and along with the Crusader's Fire Ordinator perk, damage undead enemies over time if you're close enough. This provided both a primary means of offense and defense against undead enemies. As far as healing spells go, use them if you prefer them, but your alchemy skill and good berry stockpile will handle healing better than most spells anyway. Moving on to shouts, the druid's toolset is so far large and powerful enough that I found them to be largely unnecessary. However, there are a few shouts that fit the theme, work well, and are fun to play with. Stormcall is an obvious choice for an offensive lightning weather based power, and the Kind's Peace and Animal Allegiance shouts can be used to avoid confrontations with wildlife or to add to your animal ranks temporarily. Transformations are where the druid really shines. There are four total and all have their place in a long playthrough. Human form is where you'll likely be spending most of your time as it has access to the most tools. This is where you'll be able to cast all of your spells on demand and generally control the battlefield most effectively. Werewolf form is best used for hostile areas with large concentrations of living enemies. This is because feeding on organic corpses is the best way to heal in this form, and the swift movement speed and powerful melee strikes tend to make quick and easy work of large humanoid outposts. Horned Lord form via the Force of Nature Triumvirate spell is in many ways the most powerful form in your arsenal. Having access to armor, enchantments, and unarmed perks, as well as getting bonus melee damage that scales with alteration skill, makes this form a total wrecking ball. However, it chews through Magicka at a decent rate, so this is best reserved for boss enemies with large health pools. Or you can use your OP Alchemy School to make a stockpile of Fortify Magicka potions and just stay in the form all the time if you want. But that kind of defeats the purpose of a build focused on adaptability through multiple forms in my opinion. 
Finally, we have the Deer Form from the Wild Shape Triumvirate spell. This transforms you into a graceful stag with a fast run speed when you sprint, as long as you're out of combat. I actually found it quite fun to run along the countryside looking for adventure in this form. I kept the roleplay for this playthrough fairly simple. I enjoyed this build most while roaming the countryside in stag form, looking for imbalances in nature that I could repair. Imbalances included Warlock, Necromancer, and Conjurer Covens. Dungeons infested with Undead and Dragon Priest layers are seen as abominations against nature. And even bandit hideouts can upset and corrupt a delicate ecosystem through greed and malcontent. But try not to be too restrictive. The Druid is a curious soul and will want to investigate all matters involving nature and magic and work to right any wrongs he encounters from his own unique perspective for better or for worse. He'll feel compelled to complete the main quest and both DLC quests, Dawnguard and Dragonborn. He'll also want to complete the College of Winterhold quest line as he is a practitioner of magic and scholar at heart. The Companion's Quest is also well worth doing, allowing the Druid to explore the intricacies of the Beast Blood and how to make it stronger. But mostly the Druid is a wanderer and enjoys just being outdoors and exploring nature above all else. With such a rich and diverse toolbox, the Druid has some really fun and interesting gameplay combos that you can try for in your own playthrough. Here are some of my favorites. Bramble Pit combines the Apocalypse Tumble Magnet spell with the Triumvirate Bramble Growth spell. Entering combat, you'll want to cast Tumble Magnet in a central location where multiple enemies will be sucked into a sinkhole-like area. Then, coat this area with the Bramble Growth Thorns where those concentrated enemies will be shredded by the bleed and poison effect. You can add some oomph to this combo by popping a strong Fortify Restoration Potion beforehand. I found this to be the most effective way to farm good berries and use it all the time. Be warned, however, that this will only work against living enemies as undead and automata are immune to the bleed and poison effects of the druid's brambles. Next, Hedge Maze combines the Impenetrable Grove Tree Wall with the Bramble Growth spell. You'll want to use Impenetrable Grove to create an obstacle which melee enemies will be forced to circle around to get at you. The next step is to coat the outside of the grove with the Bramble Growth spell. This will add injury to insult as the enemy chases you around in circles, taking bleed and poison damage the whole time. The next combo, Flame of Life, combines the Turn Greater Undead spell with the Ordinator Perk Crusader's Fire. With the Druid's boosted restoration skill, there are few enemies that can resist Odin's improved Turn Greater Undead spell, which is now a wave that penetrates enemy hordes, affecting all in its path. Coupled with the perk, it now also burns undead that are within close vicinity to the Druid. This works as a defensive, offensive, and crowd control tactic all in one. And the final combo is called Dova Sunvar, which in Dova Zul translates to Dragon Beast. This one works by performing at least two words of the Dragon Aspect Shout, then transforming into your werewolf form. This carries over the 125 armor rating boost, 25% boost to frost and fire resistance, and 25% damage boost to power attacks into the beast form. Coupled with unarmed perks and any spells or potions you've taken before the transformation, this is truly the beast form's full potential. Rip and tear until it is done. And there is another deep dive build guide in the books. I hope you've enjoyed it or at least found it useful. If so, please like and subscribe as it helps the channel a bunch. Thanks and see you next time.